Page 214 of The Unfolding is the story of Donna Winship. This woman who I really respected, when I asked her to teach me about how to share my faith with Muslim women, she said, Donna, you can't give away what you don't have. I won't teach you. And it crushed me. And then she looked at me and she said, but I will pray with you. And as you learn to experience God in a new way, you'll naturally know what to do with Muslim women because it'll overflow from you. And that developed into a big motto for Jamie and I. We always say this, you can't give away what you don't have. God's story has been unfolding. Since the beginning of time. He invites you to be a part of it. (laughs) Another page in the unfolding. Hey, this is Meredith Foster. When you live in some of the most difficult conflict zones on earth, it sure helps to know peace that surpasses understanding. Donna Winship and her husband, Jamie, spent more than 25 years living in places like Indonesia and Iraq. They were hard places to live and hard places to share their faith. But those difficult years forged an understanding of God's love and forgiveness Along the way, Donna discovered principles of the kingdom of God that, when put into practice, result in peace and truth that lead to freedom, even when living in a culture of war, terrorism, conflict, and death. Donna and Jamie are co-founders of Identity Exchange, an organization that helps you understand your true identity in the kingdom of God. I am from a Jewish family. Both my grandparents have incredible stories of how they came to America from Russia, Eastern Europe area. I grew up, you know, in a very conservative Jewish home, went to Hebrew school, bat mitzvah, very active in the Jewish community, in the synagogue. It was wonderful. I have nothing but good things to say, except that I never had an understanding of a personal God. I never had an understanding of a God who loves you. Judaism is a lot about traditions and the law. As anybody's growing up, you have negative emotions that you experience. And I didn't really get from my faith how to resolve those emotions, feeling guilt or shame or fear. One of my big fears was actually death. No concept of any kind of hell. If you think about the Old Testament, it doesn't really talk about hell. You know, you come to a certain age. I think our dog had died when I was like five or six. And this realization like, oh, I'm going to die one day too. What happens to me? And nobody could satisfactorily answer that question. In in fact, they would avoid the topic like it was taboo. And so I knew like, oh, this must be really bad. So you got that going on in the background, really afraid of the dark at night, not because of monsters under the bed, but because this is what it's like when you're dead, dark, alone, oblivion, this kind of thing. Had experienced some anti-Semitism, you know, different incidences through my childhood. So then that makes you feel different. I guess you could interpret feeling different as a good or a negative. In my case, it became negative. I didn't want people to know I was Jewish. You know, I'm not at the football game on Friday night because I have to go to temple or, you know, I'm not there at school, you know, because it's Yom Kippur and I have to stay home and fast. And everybody's like, where were you yesterday? Didn't want to say where I was. Then I'm lying. Then I feel guilty. And it just starts this cycle of fear, guilt, and shame. I had no one in my life I could process that with. I didn't know how to get out of it. So I became very insecure and that played out in high school, just in a sense of looking for belonging, never felt like I fit in because the majority, I went to a big giant public high school and there was only a handful of Jewish people that I didn't see during the day. Maybe I saw them on the weekends at youth group or whatever, but didn't see, you know, in my day-to-day life. And so just feeling different and trying to find that sense of belonging somewhere and Mm -hmm really couldn't find it. I joined different sports teams that didn't work out, tried different academic clubs that didn't work out. And it just reinforced, you don't fit in, you don't fit in, you don't fit in. And so really Um, developed a false identity. And a false identity is just conditioned thought patterns based on traumatic childhood experiences. And you form a a view of yourself, of a belief about yourself. So I'm forming this belief of I'm not good enough. I'm guilty. I have shame. I just didn't know how to process it. And I think most people don't know how to process it. So I'm forming a worldview at the same time, a self view of I'm not good enough. I don't fit in. I don't belong. 
Wow. Until one day somebody offers me to smoke weed in the bathroom during lunch and I do it. And then suddenly I was loved. I found a belonging. It doesn't Mm. matter that it was terribly negative and detrimental to my mental health, my emotional health, my physical health, my school health. I fit in with the crowd all of a sudden, all I had to do was get high and I fit in and they wanted me to be there. So that played out in a lot of negative ways through high school, as you can imagine. Packed up all these insecurities and fears and and shame and went off to college really just to get away and not really because I had my sights set on any big academic career. I was dating this guy and someone had shared the gospel with him at the gym somebody that was in a campus ministry, you know, and they have to go around X amount of times and share your faith, this kind of thing, shared their faith with him. And he came and got me and said, you got to go talk to this guy I met in the gym. You just won't believe it. You just won't believe what he told me. And he didn't tell me what it was about. He said, you got to go talk to him. And I didn't want to. And I had procrastinated on some research paper and I'm trying to cram it all in the last night. And I I'm like, I don't have time for this, whatever. And he literally drugged me to this guy's dorm room. And when I met him, the guy I was dating, like introduced us and then left. He had somewhere to be or I don't know, but he left. And so I'm standing there and this guy and his roommate were there. And I I didn't know him from Adam. And the guy starts in on this, like what I now know to be like a four laws, four spiritual laws, this formulaic gospel speech. Now, I grew up Jewish. The Christian terminology is like Chinese to me. These words are not in my vocabulary, which is interesting and something people need to remember, how to contextualize, how to make ideas of faith accessible to people who aren't part of your religion. Anyway, he started in on this talk telling me how sinful and separated I was from God, and the talk goes on, and hell enters the picture. And honestly, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. Like, are you telling me I'm going to hell? That's what I said to him. And he was like, well, if you don't know Jesus, I don't know who Jesus is. Here's what I know about Jesus. Hitler called himself a Christian. Christians have something to do with Jesus. And you're telling me I need Jesus? That's all I know about Jesus. So no, thank you. And then the hell piece of it. And I just said, are you telling me to go to hell if I don't? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And I just looked at him and said, you go to hell. I'm Jewish. We're the chosen people. And I turned around and started to walk away. Well, somehow he called me back in there, he and his roommate, the Holy Spirit leading and guiding him said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He admitted to me later he had never even met a Jewish person. But he started showing me prophecy from the Old Testament. He started using Mm -hmm. what I did know, what I was familiar with, my book, He was what we say, building a bridge of trust that can bear the weight of truth. I trusted what he was saying, showing it to me from what I was familiar with and what I held dear. And suddenly I found myself there till three in the morning in the conversation and in the sharing mostly of from all the Messianic Psalms, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, things like this. I realized that I do have a belonging As a child of God, I do have a belonging. I don't need to be afraid of Mm. death. God is personal and loves me and is with me and for me, and nothing can separate me from his love. And I walked back to my dorm room that night, actually crying and weeping. Jewish people aren't even allowed to talk about Jesus. Like, how can I embrace this Jesus thing as a Jewish person? It took me about two years to resolve that. Five years later, I married that guy. That was Jamie Winship who did that. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, we get a big, big laugh out of that. My first words to Jamie were, go to hell. (laughs) And now we've been married 41 years. It's interesting how that night and that first encounter really encapsulates so much of what God was going to teach you and use you to do, which we will talk about later. I hope that we get to that. Over the next two years, you were wrestling with I think this is true, but how can I do it? How can I believe it? Those two years, I talked to a lot of people that I trusted, family members, my rabbi, and nobody could answer my questions. The questions I had about Jesus and what I had learned about the connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
nobody could answer and resolve the questions that I had in a way that said, no, 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 Jesus is not the Messiah because look at this. The evidence was so clear to me. I started praying for the first time. Judaism is very similar to Islam in that we have like these set prayers that we say. Listeners might be familiar with like the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But we have these set prayers that we say in Hebrew, just like Muslims. They can be from Pakistan or Indonesia or Malaysia, but they still say the prayers in Arabic, which is not their spoken language. So I knew all these Hebrew prayers, but I never really knew how to just pray conversationally and talk to God. God was a big, scary entity up there in the sky somewhere. And you better not make him mad because like, look what's happened. Look at the history of the Jewish people. Yeah, they've survived, but all the Holocausts and Gen- Spanish Inquisition, Crusades. So I started praying. Well, the, the best thing Jamie did was he introduced me to some girls who really came along beside me and offered me an alternative belonging from the drug culture. Mm-hmm. And now I had something to do on Friday night that wasn't partying and was actually very meaningful. Started studying the scriptures with them. And then on this search, just learning how to pray, just conversational prayer with God. And I saw what were for me just miraculous answers to prayer, little things about grades and about owing money and just things resolved in my life because I didn't tell anybody, just prayed one real miracle was I was not at that time, that first year, a good student. Remember, I went to college just to get away from him. I needed to get a 100 A plus on an exam to get a D in a class. I took the exam. I didn't feel like I really did study. I didn't feel like I got a 100. It was one of the first things I ever prayed about. God, if you're real, please let me pass this class. And this is back in the day when they mail your grades home and your parents see them before you see them. You know, I was just terrified of the backlash of they're paying all this money for me to go to college and I'm flunking out. That grade came and it was a B. Like I needed a 100 A plus to get a D, whether it was a typo or what, I don't know. But what my parents saw and what I saw with my own eyes, that it was a B. If that doesn't convince a 19 year old by then, maybe I was 20, that God is real. That's just not a coincidence. Mm. It was just a realization, like, this is what I want, and this is the direction I want my life to go in. And I see a lot deeper meaning to life being with Jesus than I do with all my friends and family that don't follow Jesus. I have a plan and a purpose for you. And then I also discovered some of these ministries, Chosen People Ministries, Jews for Jesus. There's millions of Jewish people who believe this, even in Israel. That was also super encouraging. When you made that decision that two years later and you decided you're going to embrace this and believe that, was that difficult with your family? And It was difficult history? with my family. It's still difficult with my family. Okay. Just hard for them to understand and mm-hmm. not see it as a betrayal. It was very difficult. It was even, and it was horribly difficult when Jamie and I wanted to get married, but oh. we were determined not to get married if my dad didn't give us his blessing, which he did do. And we did get married. And once we were married, it was fine. It was very difficult leading up to getting married. We have a great relationship with my family. They've softened over the years and are more open-minded to discussions and things like that. I see where God's working. So you said when we were talking about that grade, it was one of those times that helped you to know that God was real. Like, okay, he really is real. But I've often heard you talk about how you also know that God loves you. He's real but he loves you. And I don't know if that came right along with that realization. I think right away in those first experiences of answered prayer, that personal relational nature of God, because even though I was studying the scriptures in a new way, being introduced to the New Testament, realizing some of the deep meaning in the Old Testament, how prophetic it is towards a messianic faith, it was information. Mm -hmm. And information doesn't change your life. It just gives you good knowledge and Mm -hmm. understanding, but it's experience that changes your life. I can be a person that doesn't know how to swim, and I can read a book about swimming and understand all the physics involved in swimming, but I'm still afraid of the water, and I don't know how to swim. 
to like get in and feel the water and realize that when I hold my breath, the air in my body will make me float and I won't sink to the bottom and drown. And if I move my arms, it's even better. Falling in love with God, you know, the realization I was experiencing him in tangible ways and falling in love with him and realizing that he loved me. And then the scripture confirmed my experience. And then I want to read the scripture more because it's like, what happened to this person? And what happened to that person? Oh my gosh, that's what's happening to me. And so my experience is confirmed in the scripture. We got married. My husband was a police officer and we lived in metropolitan Washington, D.C. area and of Virginia. And I was a teacher. I say we were chasing the American dream. Jamie had a big call on his life to be in law enforcement. That's his story. It's out there on a million podcasts. Um, it's in the book, read the book, Living Fearless by Jamie Winship. I was a teacher. We were kind of chasing this American dream, even though we loved God and we were pursuing a life of faith and really wanting a deep understanding, but we had good jobs. We were saving our money. We bought a house, you know, I'll never forget buying a second car. Then we started having babies and we bought a bigger house, you know, just this whole kind of what we think of as the American dream. Jamie had been a police officer for five years, decorated, lots of awards. He just had a unique way of understanding and responding to God, a very intuitive way. It helped his policing. And he got recruited by the State Department. And that's another big story. But we ended up going to seminary and moving overseas in 1990. It's while we were living overseas that actually everything kind of fell apart. We were living in a beautiful tropical paradise. We were working with a very militant Muslim people group, and it was just really hard. It caused us to start questioning everything. That was four or five years. Our family was very young, three small children. Jamie got arrested. Um, Our house was broken into multiple times. People spit at us on the street. We made a lot of friends and people loved us until we got to what we thought was the gospel. And I say what we thought was the gospel because we were back at the dorm room using that hell message. When you're in a very poor country, developing country, people are already in hell. They need to hear a message of life and hope, not a message that they're on the road to hell. And it Mm -hmm. didn't work. It wasn't working. And we made a lot of enemies. We couldn't figure it out. We had kind of lost that intuitive sense of how to contextualize Mm -hmm. in a way that people could receive it. We had forgotten through our training, like this idea of what happened to me going to my book. We were trained, don't touch the Quran because you open yourself up to the satanic. It just couldn't be further from the truth. We learned later There's Mm -hmm. over 100 verses about Jesus that are are true in the Quran. Why not start there? Start with Mm -hmm. what we have in common and build build that bridge of trust that can bear the weight of truth. We left that island after about five years, really discouraged, and moved to a different island. We met some people that really ended up mentoring us and becoming lifelong friends in how to hear from God and understand your identity. And what was Mm -hmm. Jesus really doing? Jesus wasn't going around telling people they were going to hell and that their whole life hinged on this decision. He's healing people. He's encountering people that are in a false sense of self, and they are experiencing him in a way that changes their whole view of life and God and themselves, and they come into their identity. So we're studying this with these new friends. In the middle of the night, I have this experience where I wake up and I strongly got this sense to lay down on the floor. And so I lit a couple candles so I wouldn't wake up Jamie. Floors in these countries are marble. Everybody has marble floors because they're cool and because wood floors are super expensive, but marble isn't. The floor was really cold in the middle of the night. And I lay down on the floor and I feel this sense to stretch out my arms in the shape of a cross. And I felt like I sensed from God him saying, you don't understand the cross. I'm going to teach you about the cross. So I laid there and I'm like, okay. And I'm waiting and waiting, just nothing. Silence after that, nothing. Well, I had learned that God peels away layers of false beliefs that we have, layers of what I was saying before, conditioned thought patterns that 
don't align with his righteousness. And so I wasn't discouraged, but I didn't know what to think. Like, okay, Mm. I'm waiting. And so I got up, I wrote down my experience in my journal, and then started living in this expectation of how he was going to teach me about the cross. Now here, I'd been to seminary and been on the field. You know, I'm in my seventh or eighth year on the field. And so it's not like I was a newbie, but it just shows you, you don't know what you don't know. And that we never know it. We're always learning. This is the mystery that we're stewards of in the kingdom of God. So three or four months go by, I've forgotten about the experience. And I go on this retreat with the ladies that were mentoring us in this listening prayer and identity. It was a small group of women and it was very intense. No fun in games. This was just deep coming before God, figuring out generational roots of iniquity and where we've believed curses about ourselves and how to break these strongholds. Lo and behold, this woman who I really respected, who had told me upon meeting her when I asked her to teach me about how to share my faith with Muslim women, she said, Donna, you can't give away what you don't have. I won't teach you. And it just crushed me. And then she looked at me and she said, but I will pray with you. And as you learn to experience God in a new way, experience Jesus in a fresh way, you'll naturally know what to do with Muslim women because it'll overflow from you. And that Uh developed into a big motto for Jamie and I and our company, Identity Exchange. We always say this, you can't give away what you don't have. In other words, you're always going to be reflecting what you've received. And at that point in my life, what had I received? A lot of failure. With failure comes shame, doubt. Does this even work? Why am I living overseas away from my family and friends if it's not working, if I'm going to get arrested? I realize this is what I'm giving away. What am I missing? This ended up in this retreat with this same woman and some others. And she stood up and started giving a talk on forgiveness. And I just had never heard anything like it. Again, at that point, I would, by Christian standards, I was very well trained. And she started talking about the cross. Remember my experience from three months before? You don't understand the cross. I'm going to teach you about here. Here it comes. I didn't recognize it at first. I looked back in my journal. But she gave this talk about the cross, about how we are the acceptance of God because of the cross. And she stood on one side of the cross and she said, we come to Jesus down on our knees before the cross, begging him. And she quoted the verse from Revelation where it says that we feel like we are nothing, that we're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked, and ashamed. And we sit there begging God to save us. And he does. He died on the cross for us before the foundations of the world, it says. He's already done it. And Hmm. we're still today begging him, living in this sense of shame, poor, pitiful, naked, blind, and ashamed. Like we don't really believe it. We come to Jesus, please help me. I'm just a worm. I'm a victim. Why aren't you helping me? You're not there for me. And we have this kind of begging mentality. Hmm. And then she stood up and she said, you just have to make a decision. And she stepped over to the other side of the cross. She said, come to the resurrection side of the cross. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this life, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and delivered. It is no longer I who live poor, pitiful, blind, naked, and ashamed. That's not who I am anymore. I'm not a victim right? I'm not a victim of what people have done to me, what I've done to myself, what people think of me, what I have. That's not my identity. Step to the other side of the cross. And on the other side of the cross, stand up straight, seated at the right hand of Jesus in the throne room with all principalities and powers under your feet. It talks about this in Ephesians. This is who you are. You reign with Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Nothing can separate you from his love. You are more than conquerors in him who loved you. You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. I can go on and on. But I watched her and she did this back and forth thing several times. And she said, this is all because of the cross and because of the forgiveness that was released that is a gift to you. It says you have forgiveness. You have redemption. By his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's the verse. 
In other words, you own forgiveness. So why are we on our knees begging God to forgive us, right? Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I'm always angry at the kids. God, please forgive me. You told me to do this and I didn't do it. And then we still don't do it. We just beg him to forgive us, right? And she's like, rise up who you are. You are daughters of the king and you have an identity and a destiny. Take your place with him. You are co-reigners with God. You are co-collaborators with God and you have authority in this. It's all through the power of forgiveness. When she was done talking, I was led to go up there and they were having a worship time and step, stand there and confess that I have believed that I'm this victim, poor, pitiful, naked, blind, and ashamed. And that's what I'm giving away to people. It just comes out of you. You know, we, if you have children, you know, they always say your children don't do what you say to do. They become who you are. They are who you are. And I had that realization about our spheres of influence. And I stepped to that other side of the cross and just had a really big experience with the Lord being able to, I think, for the first time to really apprehend the power of forgiveness. And I say now it's, it's one of our favorite teachings to do and to walk people through true biblical forgiveness. We say it's the oxygen you breathe in the kingdom of God. If you don't understand forgiveness, you're just going to always be gasping for breath. What Donna learned about the cross and forgiveness that day changed her life. Understanding that she's a daughter of the king would be key to not just surviving in some of the most difficult conflict zones on earth, but thriving there and being prepared to give away what God had given her. That's kind of like one of those watershed moments of before that experience and after that experience. And I'm sure there was a walking it out. I don't know if you're this way, but I have a tendency where I, you come to understand something new from God. There's always that temptation to go back to your false identity. There's still, you're tempted to go back to believe I'm pitiful. I'm a worm because that's, those are the Conditioned the thought patterns. Yes. That's right. The neural pathways. <laughs> exactly. 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 And you have to create new ones by intentionally practicing what you've learned. And then the old ones become extinct, really, in your brain. The more you think negative thoughts, the more those neural pathways get reinforced. They become ruts in the road and you don't even need to steer the car. The ruts are so deep. You need to stop driving in that, in that rut. And that's one of the reasons we started Identity Exchange was to give people the tools to equip them to be able to develop daily intentional practices that reinforce those experiences with God so it becomes their present reality, understanding how to practice the perpetual presence of Jesus. We're always praying for breakthrough and things. We want to be transformed. but And it's almost like, I think for many of us, I'm, I'll say for me, in my history, it's like we keep praying, 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 but we're just waiting for God to like break through and do something as opposed to transforming and renewing our mind so that those things can be accomplished. That's really the secret because God is always doing something. God is never not doing something. And so in your life, if you feel like he's not doing something, that's that question you need to ask that we discussed earlier. God, what do you want me to know about what you're doing in my life? Because if you feel like he's not doing something, you're not paying attention. He's not a still God. He's always moving. And transformation is an endless mystery, this endless discoverability. What was it like after that experience and you stepped from one side of the cross to the other? I'm sure you came home and you told Jamie everything. What was it like living it out? There was a newfound confidence and, and authority. I, I remember literally feeling a tangible feeling of like floating for several days afterwards, just walking around, just feeling like the gravity from above was stronger than the gravity from below, the gravity mm -hmm. of the earth and just this lightness and floating. But then you get back into your daily routine. And I was the principal of an international school and we had three kids in the school and living in another country and working with the nationals all the time as well in ministry. But I think the biggest thing I experienced was more of a sense of the withness of God mm. and a sense of authority. Understanding forgiveness is realizing that there is, just like in the air, there's germs, right? And so if you're sick and you breathe on me, I am receiving your germ. And now you're 
toxic poison is inside of me making me sick. But in forgiveness, just like a doctor can give me medicine to kill the germ, a surgeon can do surgery to remove the germ, true forgiveness means to cancel all effects of a debt. And so when someone in sin hurts me, when someone projects, you know, people hurt other people because they're hurt. So someone projects all their woundedness on me. Now I've received their spiritual germ and it's part of my soul and it's growing. If I don't go to the great healer, the great physician and forgive them, cancel all effects of what was done to me and allow him to do surgery to remove that and take it to the cross then I'm going to be carrying around your sickness all the time and it's going to play out in my life. I'm going to become bitter or angry Mm -hmm. and realizing that God wants to cancel all effects of that and remove that spiritual toxin from you, take it Mm -hmm. on the cross. And so you can be free. Up to that point, I didn't really know what forgiveness was except saying you're sorry for bad things that you do and Mm -hmm. feeling like, Other people that have hurt me, like it's hard to say, I forgive you. You feel like they don't deserve it. And working through those things, realizing, no, they don't deserve it, but I deserve to be free. And if I don't do it, I'm carrying around their toxic spirituality in my soul. If I don't forgive them, that makes me run to forgive people. I don't want your mess in my life. Waking up every day, I still do it. God, is there any unforgiveness in my life? Is there any person I need to forgive? Then going, sensing it and going through that process. Unforgiveness is the biggest block to hearing from God because it's taking up all the space, the results of it, feeling bitter, feeling anger, feeling rage. You start self-protecting. You start comparing, competing. All the negative results of not dealing with it is like an armor. You're self-protecting, but you're self-protecting from God to be able to work in your life because of another person. Removing that armor of unforgiveness, that self-protection layer, and being able to experience God at a deeper level was just life-changing. I was the principal of the school, being able to right away transfer these concepts to my students and helping them. You know, kids would come in to the get sent to the office for being naughty or whatever. And you know, I'm talking. I was at elementary school, so second grade, third grade, whatever. And they're like, "I'm sorry," but being able to talk about you know, it's okay. Remorse is not repentance. It's okay to feel sorry, but that's not what's going to heal a person feeling the remorse. What's going to heal the person is an experience with God as you experience him actually cutting away and Mm -hmm. canceling the effects of what was done to you. People hurt other people. Wounded people wound other people, right? But healed people heal people. And I saw God's using me in that way as I became more whole. And it's just what the lady said to me. You can't give away what you don't have, but you will experience Jesus in a fresh way when I pray with you. And out of an overflow of that, you'll know exactly what to do. Oh, it's so powerful. And obviously it was life-changing for you and had an impact on every interaction that you have after that. I've heard you guys describe it as living in conflict zones. You've, you chose for nearly three decades to live in some what many people would say, these are some of the most difficult places on on the planet. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. <laughs> we were crazy kids. You know what I mean? <laughs> now that I'm a bit older, you know, we were just so young. We really wanted to change the world. We both grew up in homes where we didn't travel a lot. And I don't know, just it with life was just the same old, same old, same old. And we both just had this desire to travel and see the world and impact people with a message of love and truth. So we started off in Indonesia. We just wanted to go where nobody else goes. We went to this little island. It was a, a, There were seven of us on our team. Didn't realize the level of just spiritual conflict. And then when we moved to another place in Indonesia where the experience I just talked about, yeah, we didn't know. The government collapsed while we were there and it was absolute chaos in the country horribly violent and riots. And we felt God told us to stay. Every foreigner we know left except for a handful of people. And our neighbors even said to us, we know now that you really love us because you didn't leave. We don't have the option to leave. And you do, and you stayed. And they said, if the riots come on our street, we'll protect you. That's not what we had in mind. We just were practicing this 
you know, we used to say to God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? And we learned that from studying the book of Acts. In Acts chapter two, that's what they're asking. They're experiencing these things for the first time. It's Pentecost and speaking in tongues. And, you know, they don't know what's going on. Through that chapter, those two questions arise. God, what is it you want us to know? And then what do you want us to do? And we just started trying to live by that. And you know, it's risky. People ask me, how can you be sure it's God speaking to you? Well, you can't. You know, you have a lot of stuff in your mind and you can't. But the only way you can know is to do it. And you know what? Just like Peter walking on the water, he did look down and sink. And what does it say? Did he drown? No. It says, the the word is immediately Jesus reached down and picked him up and got him back in the boat. Sometimes we fail, but failure is learning. All failure is learning. If we fail, it doesn't mean I'm a failure. It means I'm learning. I'm on a learning curve. No great thing was ever invented or done. You know, the Olympics happened to be on while we're recording this. How many failures did those athletes experience to become the GOAT? So the country collapsed. We stayed. We lived through it. I was a huge testimony to our national friends and neighbors And we saw God do just amazing things during that time. You know, suffering Hmm. brings about an openness of people and a vulnerability of people to hear truth. And there's that saying again, I keep repeating, we had been for three years building bridges of trust that could bear the weight of truth. After that, we were in the States a couple of years and found out about this opportunity to move to Baghdad right after the war started in 2003. And we just, again... You know, we heard about the opportunity. We were actually on our way to live in Malaysia, do a similar thing that we did in Indonesia with some of the same people. And we heard somebody talk about the at a conference this opportunity in Baghdad. And immediately I start crying. I look over at Jamie and he's sweating. And we just knew like everything in our life leading up to going to Malaysia that got us to this conference was for this moment. Three or four months later, we're in Baghdad at the beginning of the war. We were there when they caught Saddam Hussein. It was a privilege to live there for the 14, 15 months we were able to live there. We had honed this message and this skill to be able to talk to people about fear and false identities and hearing from God. And this is good news to people. This is what Jesus is doing all through all through the Gospels. He's encountering people in a false identity. Think about the Samaritan woman. Think about Saul on the Damascus Road. He's encountering people in a false identity, has some kind of interaction with them that brings them into the truth of who God is, who they are, and then they walk out in their destiny in their true identity. And you see that the Samaritan woman is just an easy one to talk about. She's an object of men, and she's dealing with fear, guilt, and shame. And she has this interaction with Jesus. And, you know, she realizes, he says to her, if you knew the gift of God standing before you, you would ask me for a drink. There she is thinking, you know, she has to give him a drink. You would ask me for a drink and out of you will flow rivers of living water, fountains of living water. And when she understands who he is and, and that it's not about religion, it's about relationship and that she's loved She goes up to the men and they follow. She becomes a leader of men. And we realize the whole scripture is about it. And so this is how we're talking to people in Baghdad who have been under, this was 2003. They weren't allowed to have the internet under Saddam Hussein. They'd been under U.S. sanctions because of the war in Kuwait. They weren't allowed to have satellite TV. It had been 10 years like that. And they didn't know anything about the world. They didn't know what was true. All they knew was propaganda from an evil dictator. And they knew it, you know, educated, reasonable people knew that. And so we had this center where we were doing all kinds of reforms in the country. We were a a State Department sanctioned non-government organization. Part of why we were hired was to help reform education. And we were teaching classes on how to use the internet. Just people would ask, who is Jesus? What, What does it mean to be a Christian? Why are you here? We'd start asking questions and they'd start talking. We saw miraculous healings. We just saw people have visions of Jesus saying, come to me, follow me, holding them, picking them up in their trauma. Be, I was there. I was weeping over you when this happened. Every single person we met had horrible trauma from that regime, Heart, kidnappings and torture, everybody. 
It was amazing. Two of our sons were still with us at the time, and it got too dangerous to live there with them. We had fallen in love with Arab culture, and we moved over to Amman, Jordan, just across the border. And we lived there for about five years. We weren't didn't move there because it was a conflict zone necessarily, but then some of what was happening in, in Iraq and flood of refugees and some conflict broke out. While we were there, we worked with a lot of Palestinians. A third of Jordan at the time was Palestinian. That gave us a desire to be in Israel. Not just that, but me being Jewish, I had always wanted to live in Israel, always. But that's where we ended up. The last place we lived was Jerusalem. We did work with some Jewish organizations, but mainly with Palestinians in the West Bank behind the security wall. Israel was the most highest conflict place we've ever lived. Now, it's terrible what's happening there now, which I don't want to get into. But when we were there 2011 to 2016, the conflict comes just from so many different groups of people living there that all want to own the land, want to own the religious sites, want to own the water, want to own the religions. People might not realize this, but just like in Christianity, there's a lot of denominations. In Judaism, there's a lot of denominations. And you've got the ultra-Orthodox, and you've got the conservatives, and you've got the reform, and you've got the secular Jews, and then everything in between. They don't get along. It's just so much conflict. And then same thing, you know, there's all these different, a lot of Christian Arabs that have been Christians since the time of Jesus, I think, in Jerusalem. But then a lot of denominations that also don't get along and want rights to this church and that place. And then just the whole Muslim element with that and, you know, very moderate Muslims that want peace and are working towards that. And then you have these other factions that are violent and sabotaging the peace process. And we were just starting in the mix. Nice Jewish girl, wonderful Christian man coming into the, to the Muslim world. And it's like the whole kingdom of God is right here. This is what Jesus was experiencing. It was also amazing, but it, that was the hardest place we ever lived for sure. Harder than Baghdad. I think about when you were in Indonesia on your first assignment there and the mistakes you were making and trying to share the gospel. And then God's taking you through this transformational process and the way that you relate, relate to people and share the gospel is very different. So even though you're living in a place with high conflict, you're going in with confidence that you have something to give away. Yeah, really. That's the truth because every human being on the planet, if, if you ask this question, what does every human being have in common? And I think off the top of our head, we would say, oh, love, love binds all humans. Together. No, that's not really true. We don't really know what love is. We really don't know what love is. But I'll tell you what every human being has in common. It's fear. All of us are afraid. All of us. If you help someone resolve their fear, that inner conflict of, I'm afraid I'm not good enough. I'm afraid that my kids are going to get in trouble in school. And that means I'm a bad parent. I'm afraid that I'm a bad parent. I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough money. All these not enough statements are huge fears in people's life. And they develop coping mechanisms to survive. What God showed us is you can't give away what you don't have, but now we have it and you can't help but give it away, is helping people identify what those fears are and recognizing that they've developed into a false identity and that you're living from fear. And what does the scripture tell us? I will keep the imperfect shalom, which is more than peace. It's a state of being of wellness and wholeness, contentment, joy. I will keep the imperfect peace whose mind is fixed on me because he trusts me. That word mind is imagination in the Hebrew. And so helping People go from that place of operating from fear, making decisions from fear. Like that's a terrible way to make decisions. If we had made the decision from fear, when our four people on our team were killed in Baghdad, violently murdered, if we had made decisions from fear, we would have left and we never would have gone to Jordan. We never would have gone to Israel. And those experiences shaped our life and our future learning how to hear from God in that fear and let him interpret your circumstances. We interpret them. It's so funny because people say to us all the time, how do you know it's really God? Well, you're listening to the voice of the world, the flesh and the devil all the time, and you never question it. 
Who doesn't hear that accusing voice a hundred times a day? You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not fit enough. How many, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough time. We never say, who's that voice coming from? We just receive it. You know why? Because it doesn't take any faith to believe the enemy or the verses, voices of the world. But it does take faith to stop and listen to the still small voice. It takes faith to stop and say, God, what do you want me to know about this? Every circumstance in your life that's filled with fear, God wants to reinterpret that fear so it's not there anymore and replace it with peace, replace it with joy, replace it with confidence. But we're going by the interpretation of the world that says, you know, when you get fired from your job, it's the end of the world. No, maybe God's moving you on to the next place and you haven't been listening to him where he's been telling you to quit, 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 and you're not doing it. So you get fired so he can move you where you're supposed to be. We're devastated when it happens. And what's wrong with me? We go right into that false identity. God, I'm losing my job today. What do you want me to know? And I'm not making light of this. I know that means your income stops. I know you have a family to feed and bills to pay. But do we believe it or not? Do we believe God is with us? Do we believe it's, I just read it in Romans chapter eight. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing. We don't believe it unless we experience it. And because so many of us live in this false sense of self and we have that armor of self-protection on, we haven't experienced. We know a lot about it, but we haven't really experienced it. I just challenge people listening, if this is new for them, to just look at the Gospels from a new lens. Look at the Gospels. Look how Jesus is bringing people into connection it's a worldview. There's a separation worldview, that worldview that says there's not enough and you're not enough and God's not going to be enough. And you need to be certain about things. And if you fail, it's that you cannot fail. It's the end of the world. And therefore you have to look out for number one. Like I got to protect me and my family first. Isn't that what God would want me to do? Then there's another worldview. We call it the connection worldview. And if you, you look at what Jesus is doing as you read the gospels, He's bringing people into that connected worldview where there is enough. There's an abundance, actually. There is enough time. It's how you manage it. Even right now, my husband was doing some research on this for his second book. There's enough food in the world right now. When we look at the statistics of starvation, especially in developing countries, they're staggering. There's enough food in the world right now to feed the world one and a half times over. But we don't manage it and people hoard it and we throw it away because of taxes and governments and corrupt governments who receive the food for poor people and sell it instead of distributing it because self-interest. But in that connected world view with Jesus, that's what he's showing us. There is enough of everything and it's okay to fail. Failure is learning and embrace the mystery. We can't understand God fully. We can't be certain about anything, but take the risk because you know what? He's with you all the time. And when you realize that you care about other people because I don't know, there's a sense of invincibility. You know, God's going to be right there to help me if I, if I'm wrong, he's not waiting me for me to get it all right, to come to him. Emmanuel, God is with us. And if anybody's out there and this is new, just read the four gospels. What is Jesus actually doing? What is he actually talking about? Use resources like Blue Letter Bible, where you can look up the word, look up what the words mean for yourself in the actual Greek. Read the Gospels. What how is Jesus actually talking to people? What's he talking about? And especially people like the Samaritan woman and um, Zacchaeus and the Gerasen demoniac on the other side of the lake that he heals. What's he really doing there? He's modeling for us how to interact for people. And he never interacted with anybody the same. He did not have a formula, just principles of transformation that work, right? What do you want me to know and what do you want me to do? I first heard those questions when I interviewed Donna's husband, Jamie, over a year ago. And since that time, I've adopted the practice of asking them pretty regularly. Anytime I feel perplexed or confused or anxious, I try to remember to ask God, what do you want me to know about this? 
What do you want me to do? It's been transformational. If you struggle to hear from God, or if you're honest, you're skeptical that you can hear from God, I highly recommend listening to the interview with Jamie Winship. It's page 168 of The Unfolding. Donna and Jamie have a passion to give away what they've learned. So if you want to know more about hearing from God and living in your true identity, head to identityexchange.com. You can learn more about Jamie's book. It's called Living Fearless. And Donna recommends a free resource on their website. It's called Finding Hope in Depression. She was quick to say, you don't have to be struggling with depression to get great value from this series. It's a series of short videos that help you experience God's transformation. I've listened to it a couple of times over this past summer. It was super helpful to me. I've got links to all of these in the show notes. Thanks so much to Donna for sharing her story. Hey, if Donna's story or any episode of The Unfolding has been instrumental in your walk of faith, I'd love to hear about it. Click the link for the microphone button in the show notes. If you love hearing these powerful God stories and you'd like to make a gift to help them continue, head to wowgod.com. Thanks to The Unfolding team, Lindsay Caparoon, Michael Shermack, and our producer and network director, Jason Rakow. The Unfolding is a Wow God production. Discover more at wowgod.com.